Welcome to Symbolically Kiwi. I'm Mr. Geometric, also known as Ang, and Symbolically Kiwi is about sharing and celebrating Kiwi success stories. But we're not painting these people to be heroes, we're showing how they're just humans and they have struggles and they have childhoods and they have backgrounds and if they can do it, then so can you. So it's all about celebrating success, celebrating what we've achieved as a nation and about harnessing your potential. So my art style is based on how we see as humans. So if you're looking at me right now, say you're looking at my face, first your brain sees the edges of my face and then it combines them to make a shape like a circle. And the final piece is there's some texture. And once it can see the texture, it recognizes me as a person. If the texture wasn't there, I might be a mask or a mannequin. So that's kind of what my art style is based upon. So what I've done is taken these 10 symbolic Kiwis and created a shape which is unique to each of them. So they have uh, taken like the key elements of their life and, and created a shape which is unique to that person. And then we made it out of material which is also unique to that person. So let me take you through the exhibition. First, we've got Joseph Parker. Now, Joseph Parker is a world champion boxer, but he wasn't always a world champion boxer. He grew up in South Auckland, proudly born in South Auckland. And he started boxing, I think, right from when he was a kid with his dad. Um, and then he, he went on, he kept, he kept training, he kept competing, and he went on to become the world champion, the WBO heavyweight champion of the world. And he was involved in the biggest uh, fight in 2018 with Anthony Joshua, the unification of the heavyweight championship. So for his, um, his shape, I've taken the, the boxing ring, so the three ropes of the boxing ring, and combined them together to make this, this square shape. And then he's also got a Samoan heritage. So I've taken the, uh, a Polynesian hook, which he wears around his neck, and combine that. So we've made a shape here which is unique to Joseph Parker. And also we made that material out of a red leather. And that red leather symbolizes his boxing gloves and also the, the leather you would find on the ropes of a ring uh, because he's a boxer. So this is unique to Joseph Parker and it kind of symbolizes him and sums him up in a piece of art. This is also life-size, they're all life-size. So he is pretty much this big they're all about 20 centimeters off the ground but aside from that like this is this is how big joseph parker is and you you'll see it in the video as well cool over to jess so jess is our other tall symbolically kiwi uh symbolic kiwi so she used to be a netballer and her whole life she wanted to be a professional netballer and she achieved it she became a professional netballer um, but within a few years of playing it she realized it wasn't as fulfilling as she thought it would be. And so she'd spent her whole life wanting to be this one thing and it, it didn't turn out as the way she wanted. So she made a very brave decision to change careers and, and pursue music. Uh, so now she's a rapper and she's a rising star. She's got over a million listens on like various songs on Spotify. Um, and her first album when it came out, um, it was called Bloom. And it was all about coming into her own as a musician and, and blooming and really uh, really developing and everywhere there was sunflower imagery uh, sunflower imagery so we really wanted to symbolize that and, and use that strong sunflower imagery um, and then of course she's a musician and we were like no material better symbolizes a musician than vinyl records so each of these little black dots is made out of vinyl records so we've hand punched it my team were telling me not to do it they're like it's a very hard material to work with. If you laser cut it, it releases poisonous gas. Um, so we had to hand punch them. It took about 20 hours to get it done. So there's 10 volumes of Mozart have gone into making this. But the effect is super cool because when you look at it from an angle, you can see the various different uh, circles of the petals shining and glimmering. So that's Jess B. Over into our second silo. Our second silo features Helen Clark and Nick Mowbray. Let's start with Helen. So Helen, most people will know her as the Prime Minister of New Zealand, the ex-Prime Minister. She was a Prime Minister for nine years. But what most people won't know is that she grew up on a sheep and cattle farm in West Waikato. And she was a lecturer. And then after she became a lecturer, she went into Parliament. And she was there for 27 and a half years. And only the last nine years, was she the, the prime minister? In her first year as leader of the opposition, 
she had just a 2% prefer preference rating, which means only 2% of people wanted her to be prime minister. Like that's, that's insane for a, um, for a leader of the opposition to have. And yet she overcame that and she went on to lead our country for nine years. After that, she went up, ended up working at the UN as the third highest ranking official at the UN. So what I've done for her shape is I've taken the UN logo, I've stripped that back, I've taken out the countries and left the circle to represent the globe, and we've replaced the laurel wreaths and replaced them with silver ferns to re represent the work she's done for New Zealand. And this is actually made out of recycled milk bottles. So they're like melted down milk bottles into the sheet which we water jet cut and placed into this into this artwork to represent her focus on sustainability, uh, which she's a, a massive champion for. So that's Helen Clark. Over to Nick Mowbray. Now this wasn't intentional, but I realize now that both of these people grew up on farms. So Nick also grew up on a farm in uh, Tokoro. Um, and he was the youngest of four children. And he had this, I guess he had this dream. So he went to China when he was 18 with his, uh, with his brother and they lived on just $1 a day. Now that sounds like a cliche, but they were literally living on $1 a day. They lived, lived off rice and noodles. Um, he told me that for Christmas, they went to McDonald's. Like even that was a treat. They wouldn't even spend that unless it was for a special occasion. And so they grinded, they lived on nothing. And now they've created the sixth biggest toy company in the world. So they've got over 8,500 staff in 23 countries around the world and worth many billions of dollars. One of those toys, one of those iconic toys is a bunch of balloons, which lets you fill up like 35 balloons at once. Um, so I've taken that bunch of balloons imagery and kind of, again, abstracted them, used the circles to represent them. Um, and for his material, we've used a uh, yellow acrylic uh, to find the, the, the plastic that you would find on their toys. And the yellow is because they have such strong, bold yellow branding. So that's Nick Mowbray. Over into our third silo. So we've got quite a mix of, of Kiwis here. Perhaps we start with Peter Beck. Now, Peter Beck is one of my favorite stories because when he was a child, his, um, his careers advisor called his parents into the school. And that's always troubling when your parents get called into the school. And they said um, his aspirations were unreasonable and that he should just go work at a factory. He should go work at the TY aluminum smelter. Um, thankfully, he didn't listen to that. And now he's created a rocket industry in New Zealand. So he's the CEO and founder of Rocket Lab and they put launch vehicles, they put rockets into space. And Electron, their launch vehicle, is the fourth most frequently launched rocket in the world. So New Zealand launches more than Europe, we launch more than Japan. So we're the fourth most frequently rocket launching company in the world. And that wouldn't happen if it wasn't for Peter Beck. And that wouldn't happen if he had listened to his careers advisor. So for his shape, I've used uh, the orbitals of an atom, which you can also find on their logo um, because there's physics involved and also because the orbitals represent the orbitals of a satellite, which they're putting off into space. Now, what you can probably see is this cool kind of textured material, but when you touch it, it's actually it's smooth like glass and your hand just glides over it. And that's because it's carbon fiber. So their rockets are made out of carbon fiber. And when I visited Rocket Lab's factory in Mount Wellington and got to touch one of the rockets, I was like, we have to use this material. Like it, no, there's no better material to use for Peter Beck than this cool carbon fiber material. Um, and it's, it's come out fantastic. Oh, over to Kirsten Dodgen. So Kirsten's another one where, where her teachers were kind of telling her to quit and we're very glad she didn't. So Kirsten is a world-class dancer. She's danced behind names like Jennifer Lopez, Justin Bieber, Jason Derulo, Rihanna, and I think she's still only like 22, uh, which is insane. So yeah, she, as she was dancing in high school, she was, she was like dancing 40, 50 hours a week on top of going to high school. And her teachers were telling her, oh, maybe you should just quit. Maybe you should just focus on school. And she was like, what do you mean? Like, I have this amazing, amazing passion, amazing hobby. And fortunately, she, she stuck with it. And now, as I said, she dances with all these amazing people. For her shape, I've used um, a crown. Uh, so she dances with the Royal Family Dance Group, which uh, also have a crown. And I've, I've basically stylized that and made it more angular and then also added some curves to kind of represent 
I'm not going to do it, but they have a certain dance style, um, which is dynamic and it moves and it changes really quickly. So I wanted to capture that. Uh, there's also a heart in the middle, which represents the family aspect of the Royal Family Dance Group. They, they really are a community and, and a family. So there's that love, which I wanted to portray. And for the material, we've used a brass to represent gold. Um, and that's because it's, it's a Royal Family Dance Group. And again, if you catch this from the right angle, you can see the, the light kind of glimmering off it as you move. So another, another super cool uh, material, which plays with, with lighting. <clears throat> Over to Joey Damon. So Joe is a, is a comedian, uh, but he wasn't al always a comedian. He only started doing comedy, I think, three years ago. But as soon as he did his first gig, he knew, like, this is what I want to do. And this is what's going to make me happy. And I'm just going to, I'm going to eventually make it. I'm just going to keep going. So he did 300 shows over three years. Um, he was telling me he would drive to Wellington for a gig, which paid less than the petrol it took to get there. He drove up to a car tire. So I guess he's traveled the length of the North Island um, for, again, a gig where they kind of got, kind of got booed and didn't get, end up getting paid. Um, he was working, he was doing jobs like laboring. He was cleaning cars just to make ends meet. Uh, while, while pursuing comedy. His friends were off, you know, doing, doing careers like medicine, law, accounting, investment banking. And they were all looking at him like, you know, like, what are you doing? You're not, you're not really going anywhere. Why are you still doing this? But he stuck with it. Um, over in, in Feb this year, so Feb 2020, during lockdown, he kind of, he kind of blew up and, and claimed to fame. He went from like 10,000 followers to 40,000 followers in a matter of months. Um, and he became the youngest comedian to sell out the Sky City Theatre, which is a theatre which has 700, <clears throat> 700 seats and usually reserved for like overseas comedians. Locals don't usually sell it out, but he managed to become not only a local who sold it out, but the youngest ever to sell it out. And I think he's 24. Um, for his symbol, I've created a mic, which is kind of the tool of his trade. Um, he's half Fijian and half Maori. So I really wanted to represent that strong symbology and that cultural symbology because it makes a huge part of what we are as New Zealand. So we've got the head of the mic, which is this beautiful koru uh, to represent the Maori symbology. And then we've got some Fijian symbology on the handle of the, the, the microphone. Now the material is made out of green India marble and it's like, it's pretty thick. It's 1.5 centimeters thick. And we wanted to use that to represent ponamu. Now, Ponami doesn't come this big, so we had to use a substitute, but it, it's probably the closest thing to Ponami when it feels very cold to touch and it feels very similar. So this is Joey Damon. Next into our, our final, final silo. <coughs> Let's start with Ranjana. So Ranjana is one where I, I hadn't actually heard of her until a month or so before I actually interviewed her and, and got her involved in this and someone recommended her to me. Um, but it was a story which was fantastic. And as soon as I was told it, I was like, we have to get, she has to be involved in this exhibition. So Ranjana is a third generation Kiwi and her and her husband started a, well, her husband was a doctor in the seventies and um, a mentor of theirs the said that, hey, New Zealand isn't actually ready for a specialist with an accent. Like You need to go and practice general practice in an area which looks like you and sounds like you. And that was the harsh realities of the time. So they took that advice and, and they kept building on it. And now they have over 50 clinics. They've got over 1,000 staff and they have 260,000 registered patients. That's just the registered ones. So they serve, I think, closer to a million all up. Um, so providing this fantastic health care to the community, I think they have White Cross, they have local doctors, so you've probably come across those clinics. Uh, for her shape, um, so I'm, I have an Indian background as well, so I was very happy to use some Indian symbology. So we've got this beautiful lotus shape, which you find everywhere on mandalas. Um, and then also it's featured in her family harm program, Gandhi Navas, that lotus symbology as well. Inside the petals, I've placed the logo of her health company, Tamaki Health. And it just creates this kind of beautiful symmetry. Uh, finally, for the material, we've used a white glossy acrylic because I was like, you know, what other material represents clinics and hospitals when you go there? You often see a lot of this material. So again, we wanted to use that to, to represent her. 
Cool. Over to um, Michelle Dickinson, a nano girl. A lot of people have come through. So we've had about 1,100 and it'll be 1,200 people by the end of tonight through this exhibition. And the kids that come through, they don't know a lot of these people, but they all know Nano Girl. So Nano Girl, Michelle Dickinson, she's got a fantastic story. So she kind of grew up all over the world. When she was five, she was in Hong Kong, uh, living really close to the poverty line, actually, and her parents didn't have any education. Um, you know, she wasn't speaking English at the time. And in her words, she was like, I was just speaking Chinese with my Chinese family and eating rice. Um, and that's really that not having access to that education or her parents not being educated really inspired her to build this company, which is now providing education to kids all over the world. So Nanogirl Labs is an education company and they provide um, as an education to people all over the world. They're in 107 countries um, and lots of different languages. She's even been dubbed in Zulu, which is the, um, the African language famous for the, the clicking noises that they make. So yeah, fantastic story. And we really wanted to, to show her overcoming that hardship to take those struggles of education and, and bring her knowledge to everybody else around the world as well. So for her symbol, we've used the Nano Girl uh, flask or the Nano Girl beaker. You'll find that in her, in her logo, but it also you find it in science labs all over the world, right? Um, it's, it's a great symbolism for experimenting and kind of just giving things a go. And we've made that out of um, white acrylic. So that on the bottom, there's a white acrylic and then there's a clear acrylic on top, which you can kind of see here because it's sticking out. Um, and the clear acrylic and the white acrylic represents materials you would find around the lab. So the clear acrylic is like the safety goggles you would wear. And then she's also got an engineering background. So we wanted to use nuts and bolts to, to symbolize that. So there's nuts and bolts here to symbolize her engineering background. She was actually my engineering lecturer at uni. Um, so that's, it's cool to be able to work with her on this as well. And our final symbolic Kiwi, last but definitely not least, is Kane Williamson. So Kane Williamson is our cricket captain for the Black Caps. He's one of the best cricketers in the world, but he won't, he won't tell you that because he's extremely humble. Um, so he grew up just in a normal family in Tauranga. I think he was in a family of five and they were encouraged to try whatever they wanted. And cricket is what really appealed to him. So he would come home um, and he would go straight into the nets or he would go into the carport and have this ball hanging on a string and he would just be swinging at that. So I guess from, um, from those roots, he, he was always focused on, I guess, learning and the curiosity and just developing kind of every day. And it came naturally. So it was just, for him, it was a journey of exploring his passions and just having fun with it. Um, and those were his reasons for, for going and, and still going today. Like he's, he's still trying to improve every day. Um, so yeah, we wanted to sh share that story of, of improvement. And again, just starting from just a normal family and being one of the best cricketers on the planet. For his shape, um, this was a bit of tongue in cheek. So he's called um, Captain Kane or Steady the Ship. So we're like, let's make him his own steering wheel. So we've used... Um, and that's what it is, it's like his own steering wheel, right? And we've used the materials you would find in the game of cricket. So this is actually the width, about the width of a cricket ball. And then the material itself is a patent leather, which you would find on a cricket ball. The handles of the steering wheel are made out of cricket bat handles, or they look like cricket bat handles, and they're made out of ash wood, which is the wood found on cricket bats. So again, a shape which is unique to, to Kane Williamson, Captain Kane and with materials which you would find in the game of cricket. And that was our final symbolic Kiwi. Uh, if you follow me through to this, uh, the theater room, what I've done is I've conducted, I've conducted interviews with all of them because what we're trying to do is show that, hey, you know, they're just normal people and if they can do it, you can do it. So what we're doing is kind of talking to them about their backgrounds and their histories and their struggles and failure and what they think about success. Um, and we've combined them all into like a super interview. So if you follow me through this way, you'll get a, a cool taste for it. Cool. So I'm here with Joseph Parker. Joseph, thanks for joining us as part of this exhibition. Um, so the purpose which we've spoken about already is to 
try and dispel tall poppy syndrome by highlighting Kiwi success stories, celebrating them and sharing them. When any Kiwi succeeds, I think we all, we all succeed collectively um, and their success amplifies our own success. But also showing how you know, symbolic Kiwis, they're still just people, you know, they have a childhood, they have struggles and they're not that different from everyone else. And by doing that, showing that, hey, if these people can achieve these successes, then, then so can you and so can, so can all the kids come sure. and see this exhibition. I guess a good place to start would be, you know, who is Kirsten or where is mm. Kirsten now? now let's let's wind, wind back the clock and and talk about Helen. And Please talk us, talk us through what your childhood was like and what, what it was like just growing up in, in your family. Yeah, so I was born in Tokoroa. Okay. The youngest of four, the youngest of four. So I was born and raised in Auckland. I'm half Kenyan and half um, Pakia. So I was born in Aloha, uh, Wellington, um, to a Fijian mother and a lovely father. I grew up on a farm in the West Waikato on the uh, slopes of Mount Parongia, a sheep and cattle farm. So I grew up in Invercargill. I'm a third generation Kiwi. My grandfather came out in the 1920s on a ship where there were 20 young men. Half were Gujarati and half were Punjabi. In uh, Auckland, New Zealand. So Auckland, born and raised. I'm mixed race and my mum is Hong Kong Chinese and my dad is half Maltese and half English. And, but at the age of five, I had been living in Hong Kong and hanging out with my Chinese family, not speaking English and eating rice. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, what would be great is to talk about um, where you are now and, and what you've achieved because a lot of people will know you, but a lot of people, I mean, kids coming through may not be as familiar with you. <laughs> uh, being a member of parliament then for 27 and a half years, which included nine years as prime minister. Then I went to the United Nations to head the UN development program, which was a, a big and important program. So I think a lot of people know me as a, as a, as a fighter, as an, as an athlete. Um, what I've achieved in boxing, was able to win New Zealand title, world title, and then was able to um, be in one of the biggest fights in 2018, Unification Heavyweight Championship of the World. Wow. I'm a dancer. Where I am today in dance are behind a few names, Rihanna, J-Lo, um, Justin Bieber, Jason Derulo, and a few more. But yeah, and a few, and yeah, a few yeah. more, this is amazing. <laughs> no. Rocket Lab is building launch vehicles, building rockets. Electron, our launch vehicle, is the fourth most frequently launched rocket in the world right now. Mm -hmm. So we launch more than Europe, we launch more than Japan. Um, so, uh, you know, we've quickly moved up the ranks of launching nations. We're the only organisation in New Zealand that is privately owned that does have that many doctors working for them. Over a thousand staff. Uh, 260,000 registered patients. Nice class city, which is 700 seats. And yeah, usually reserved for like the bigger sort of, sort of overseas comedians. Got two sold out shows. And, and sold out shows all across New Zealand as well. So all across New Zealand, so my whole tour every day sold out in like two hours. That's crazy. Yeah, so Nana Girl is actually a character and it's one of the brands that we have under Nana Girl's lab which is basically an education company all about making positive change in the world and making sure everybody everywhere has access to education. <laughs> now we're in 107 countries and multiple languages, yeah. And we've built Zuru into what is one of the largest toy companies in the world. I think we're up to number six. We have about 8,500 staff now, 23 offices around the world. So I'm an artist, musician. Yeah, songwrite, rap. A few people like it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, a million people. But. <laughs> yeah. Could just be my mum yeah. one million times on repeat. But, you know, what? At, at, at the end of the day, like, I guess it, numbers doesn't matter as long as I, like, you know, there's a cool exchange going on, which I think that there is, so I'm pretty happy. Like, hey, I want to become one of the best cookers in the world. I just set off to look at and just having sixes every time. People might look at you and say, wow, mm. Helen's achieved all these amazing things. She's mm. worked at the UN, she's been Prime Minister. Mm. She's like, every time she stepped up to the plate, she's kind of hit it out of the park, which <laughs> probably isn't true, right? <laughs> so um, what would be great is if you could share a moment or, or a time where you, you really had to struggle to, to get where you are now to, to show that you know the path isn't easy for anyone. Well, the worst struggle was when I became leader of the opposition. I had a terrible time establishing myself as a potential prime minister, even towards the end of my first year in the job, hitting 2% as preferred prime minister, wow. which I refer to as the death zone. But I crawled out of the death zone. Yeah, what, wow, 2%? 2% wanted me as prime minister. Wow. <laughs> and then you were there for nine years. That's right. That's amazing. Um, stand up and... And, you know, just doing any job I can to sort of 
make sure I had money that I was doing like labouring and cleaning cars and stuff. Money and they were like, where is this going? My childhood was amazing, but my parents didn't have any education and we were, you know, growing up right around the poverty line, things were tough. We grinded, we lived on nothing. We lived on one dollar a day in China, literally. Like that sounds like a cliche, we lived on a dollar a day, we literally did. And we would literally live off rice and noodles. And I remember we actually celebrated Christmas at McDonald's. Even that was a trick. And a very wise mentor back in the 70s said to him, New Zealand isn't ready for a brown specialist with an accent. You need to go and do general practice in an area that looks like you and sounds like you. I went from school with this straight into the med store, into the car court, being a bull on the street, and it's <laughs> a bit of a drill that I used to do. And My teachers were telling me, Oh, maybe you should just pull out. You should just continue with school. And I was like, what do you mean? But there was no real guidance of what to eat, when to sleep, how to train. The thing that I wanted most for my life, not actually being a possibility anymore or not being something that was going to happen potentially, yeah. was really hard to come to terms with, I think. The careers advisor uh, called my parents into the school and told them that my aspirations were unreasonable and mm -hmm. I should go and work for the TY Aluminium smelter. The, the tall poppy syndrome here is, is awful, but it's not everybody who's thinking like that. There's always people who want to see others do well and get ahead. Mm -hmm. And I think in a career like this one or any career, surround yourself with the positive people, not the negative people who tell you you can't do it. If someone tells me I can't do something, I'll always want to do it. Yeah. Uh, so just uh, don't give the naysayers the satisfaction of knowing that they've got to you is an important uh, principle to act on. I, I think it's really sad. I think we should be celebrating entrepreneurial success far more because that is what can help drive this country forward. Because that's what's like their success is our success. Correct. It is the country's success. And if we want to stop being just reliant on tourism, education, and agriculture, how do we create more global companies? How do we create more global brands? How do we create more global tech companies? And to do that, we have to make it part of our culture to embrace success in these areas and encourage people to go into them and actually start really early. Mm -hmm. People are afraid, I feel, people are afraid of, of going for something really big because if, if they get it, then sweet, like that's all. But they still want to have comments. Yeah. But if they don't get it, then they'll get smashed. Yeah. They're just going to get ridiculed and it's like, we should, we should. We should tried. celebrate um, success. We should celebrate people trying. We should celebrate everything. Everything's about, you know, celebration. You've got to celebrate effort and life just every day, mm -hmm. you know. That's beautiful. Everybody thinks you're nuts until you do it. Mm -hmm. And then it's just called, you know, great vision and foresight. And to be honest, I'm just excited for what you're doing. Yeah. Seriously, because it's one of those things that the country needs. We've always talked about it. You know, we need to improve. We need to be better. We need to support each other. But then again, it gets brushed to the side. Mm. And then all of a sudden it's, you suck. You know, you're not good enough and this and that. Yeah. But if we make everyone aware and... We make it cons consistent where everyone's hearing about it all the time, then all of a sudden the whole country will change. But mm -hmm. for now, it's still in that little tall poppy syndrome area. Do you think we think big enough as Kiwis? Do we dream as big as we could? At an individual level, I think so. There are just incredible, remarkable, extraordinary New Zealanders out there doing amazing things, both from a home base and mm -hmm. also uh, offshore. And it's important to really value the offshore Kiwis because they always talk New Zealand up, yeah. in my experience. They're, they're so positive about the opportunities that New Zealanders gave them. But as a country, I think we sometimes have a hard time raising our expectations as, as to what we could be. Mm. Uh, we don't dream big enough. We should dream. Like, I want to be unified champion. I want to reign for five or ten years in a heavyweight division. That's my dream. And I can achieve it. If you put it out in the world, mm. it's already out there, and then you can aim to achieve it. 100%. Well, I think we should, everyone should dream big. Because it's not, it's not silly to dream big. Mm -hmm. You know, you can make it your reality. And it, what's the worst that could happen? What's the worst that can happen? You don't quite get there, but you can still try. You can keep trying. Never give up. Not being afraid to I suppose to explore those options. And um, you know, who knows if that to, to come off and be fruitful, but you know, at worst, you've given it a, a fair go and, and you've seen what's out there and perhaps it's not quite as scary as you want to That's true. Well, I think what, what I found, that's what you found, is nothing's 
Nothing is truly as risky as you think it is. Yeah. It's like, what's the worst ever happened? Yeah, you create this ideas in your mind and you know, sort of monkey you there. That's mm -hmm. right. Yeah, what's the worst ever yeah. At the end of every show, you're like, you can do anything you want. Yeah, yeah. And, I, and since you said that, I've noticed everyone who's made it, or is like supposedly made it, they're like, almost we can't believe we're here. Yeah. If, if we're here, like, you can do it. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it's one thing that, it's like another thing that I've added to that I, I find when I talk about it is that um, you, actually are, you actually are allowed to, you know, shoot for whatever it is you want to. Because you never know how far you will go or you never know what you will become. I never thought I would be the person or the dancer I am today. And I was just chilling in school dancing because I loved it. You know what I mean? So the world is literally your oyster. Giving people the understanding that they can be the best at what they do. Mm -hmm. There's no reason. Someone's got to be. Yeah. Someone's got to be doing something really well in every different category and industry and vertical. Why can't we be that person that does it the best? There's the same amount of effort that goes into building a hundred million dollar startup than a billion dollar startup. Mm -hmm. So why would you just bother? Why, why, why bother you know, starting at the bottom? And also to develop that self-confidence that you can do it as well as anybody else. So what, what would be your advice then to, to someone who's coming up in dance or in the entertainment field and they are coming up against, like, they, they believe they can do it but they're hearing yeah, all these negative can't. things. It's really... At the end of the day, you are yourself, and if you want to do something, you need to just put your all into it. Regardless, there's always going to be people that are going to tell you you can't do it. Oh, I don't think that's the one. You maybe should try something else because someone else is doing it. I feel like you need to believe that you have something that someone else doesn't have. You know what I mean? Everyone has a spark in them, and if this is what you want to do, you need to put your all into it. Well, I think ultimately you can have an incredibly fulfilling life if you do the things that you're passionate about. Mm -hmm. um, working in a job that you're not passionate about or, you know, just drudging through life, uh, at some point you've got to say, well, what was the point of all this? Mm -hmm. um, like I say, you're, you're on a really, you're, you've got a, such a short period of time to, to live your life. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, make sure the things you do, you really, really enjoy that you're passionate about. And if you can make a difference, then um, that I think, all, all as humans, we should all strive to make a difference for everybody else. Mm -hmm. How do you think externally people think about failure? So, say if, if I endeavor to do something and I fail, I might think about it one way, but is that often going to be harsher than what other people think about it? What's your Yeah, so I, I find that people who suffer from imposter syndrome specifically, and a lot of females in this space, have a fear of failure and take it very personally. So rather than say, oh, this didn't work because of lots of multiple things. They go, this didn't work because I suck. And that really can kill the confidence in a person. And I think sometimes it's it's good to go, well, this didn't work. And maybe I suck a little bit, but there are other things in play. And now I've learned from that, I would do it differently next time. So let's try again. There are lots of people I meet who have had one failure and now are too afraid to fail again. But if you talk to any successful person, they will tell you all about their stuff up and how that's got them on this journey to where they are. Mm -hmm. If they got it right, I would say um, uh, success is a terrible teacher. Because if you get it right first time, you don't learn anything. I feel like we tend to think in a, in a small manner until mm -hmm. something happens, and then mm -hmm. you realise that actually, wow, all this is possible. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what I want this exhibition to be mm -hmm. for a lot of kids. Mm -hmm. So for kids coming through the exhibition, what would be your advice um, to them? My advice is believe in yourself. Have a plan. Keep changing the plan because your aspirations will keep changing. But if you don't have a plan, you're going to hit it every time, aren't you? You're just not going to go anywhere. You'll wonder where the years have gone. So set your goals. Work towards them. Adapt them. You'll be amazed at where you'll be five years on from that first plan. Firstly, who cares what people say, right? If you back yourself to do something, you better back yourself 100% and you go for it. It doesn't matter how long it'll take, as long as you want to do it, you go ahead and do it. And as long, I mean, if you have a dream, dreams do come true. I had a dream, it came true. Mm -hmm. And like I said, don't, don't wait for others to say that you're good to do this and do that. If you're good enough in your mind, back yourself 100%. If this Indian girl from finishing secondary school can start a business in Otara, 
the lowest socio-economic area in New Zealand and grow it to this size, anything is possible. Um, you know, we all think that it takes, you know, this extraordinary version of ourselves to achieve our dreams, but um, you literally can just do it with, with, who, yeah, with who you are. Uh, you not only are more than enough. It's just to remember, we're all human beings. We all start somewhere. We all go through whatever we need to go through to get to where we are today. And it was not handed on a plate. We are the same person. And we all have the same struggles. Maybe yours is unique. But take that, grab onto that, and make sure that it forms the person that you want to become. You remember all those struggles. You remember all that hard work that you've been through because it's going to make you the person that you want to be or maybe even beyond, you know. Start. Start young and think as big as you possibly can. But just start. Because if you start, you will eventually find your way up the hill and then everything will come together. But start. If you get knocked down, get up again. Persist. Don't take no for an answer because you can become the best at something. You've just got to believe in yourself to become the best. Look, I think kids dream big. You always hear a three-year-old think they're going to be everything. And adults take that away from children. We try and bring rules and boxes back to their lives and say, oh, no, you can't be this, and you can't be that, or don't be this. And so my advice is always be what you want to be because you can change. You can do other things. There's no one career for life that you want. Try some things. If you don't like it, you know, you don't like it. Mm. But maybe you'll love it. Um, so don't feel like there's only one thing that you can be when you grow up. Actually, lots of grown-ups have a squiggly line where they've done lots of different things, and, and that's great. Ignore what everybody has to say. Um, people, your success is governed by two things, like deciding that you want to do it mm -hmm. and how hard you work. Those are the only two things that, that are really the boundary conditions to achieving it. So um, think big and go for it. The only two things? That's the only two things. The hardest thing is just deciding that you're actually going to do it. Mm -hmm. Once you've decided you're going to do it, that's like 50% of the hardness over. Mm -hmm. And then it's just a matter of work. It's just a matter of execution after that point. Yeah. When you say decided, you mean this is, this is what I'm going to do yeah. and there's no... There's no stopping it. Mm -hmm. yep. To be 100% you. And because that, that's the thing that people love the most, right? We really like when we have artists or entertainers or actors we love them as people right? and I think that if you can be yourself and give like a message that people can relate to um, then you'll be sweet and make sure you always enjoy it mm. go big go really big sweet now if you come on through to the photo gallery so this is our final silo um, and what we're trying to do here is a lot of art exhibitions or even art galleries, some of them don't even let you take photos, but some of them let you take photos with the art and people like to pose with them, but no one lets you become part of the story, to become part of the art. Now the whole point of Symbolically Kiwi is to celebrate these stories, but also show that they're not that different from you. That's why if you have a look around, they're all wearing normal black clothes because anybody can wear normal black clothes. You're not seeing Nano Girl in her lab coat. You're not seeing Kane Williamson in his black caps outfit. Um, you're not seeing Kristen in her dancing outfit. They're all just wearing normal black clothes and I'm wearing normal black clothes and you can be wearing normal black clothes because we're just people. So what we do here is instead of giving you a print of this um, to take home as a reminder, we want, to, we want you to become part of the story. So what we do is we invite people to pick up these shapes and pose with them to pick the story or the, or the shape which resonates most with you. Um, perhaps I'll pick Joe Damon, because 300 shows over three years and, and driving around a lot for no guaranteed future of, um, of success is, is inspirational, really. And then you stand with the shape that you like best. We take a snapshot. And then we print that out for you and you get an A3 print and a really high quality A3 print to take home with you as a, as a reminder of of this exhibition of the inspiration that you've you've received here today but also as a token of hey you know i can actually achieve this level of greatness um, everybody here has had struggles they've shared those struggles with you 
you may be going through your own struggles, but just know that you know, anybody is capable of greatness and you certainly are capable of greatness. Thank you for joining me at Symbolically Kiwi's virtual tour. I've been Mr. Geometric um, and thank you. Sweet. <laughs>